Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you listening right now. Thank you, Michelle Sergio, Kirk Stephenson, Miranda Janelle, and Natalie Sargent. On this episode of DTNS, turns out Reddit's doing just fine, thank you. Why a simple counting error led to the CrowdStrike Windows outage, and video game movies were looking good. And then Borderlands came. <laughs> this is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, August 7th, 2024. In Los Angeles, I am Tom Merritt. From Studio Animal House, I am Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, a very also measured, I am Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And uh, with the four of us together, we are... Voltron. The four oh. musketeers. <laughs> All, of All of those things. All of those things. I was really and hoping more. for Voltron. That's a bummer. <laughs> yeah. right. We are the, the four Voltron musketeers. That's us. <laughs> We are a four cornered room. We're a four cornered hat. I like of the four corner states. <laughs> Let's start with the quick hits. Disney said on its earnings call that it will begin the crackdown on password sharing starting in September. The company is going to roll out paid sharing options as well, although it hasn't said how much those paid options will be. Disney's streaming business is now profitable for the first time. Disney Plus added 1 million subscribers, and Hulu added just shy of 1 million on its own. Disney also announced it's going to raise prices on October 17th by a dollar or two per package. So the bundles of Disney Plus, Hulu, and ESPN Plus aren't going to change in price. Disney Plus will also add new linear channels, including ABC News Live, starting September 4th. It was odd that Disney didn't have any news because Peacock and Paramount Plus do. So there you go. Uh, Roku is launching a free ad-supported sports channel on August 12th. It will have a Major League Baseball game, <laughs> I think like one a week. Uh, Formula E car races, that's the EV uh, racing. Top rank boxing, a uh, bunch of other sports. There are also some news and documentary shows. They're making some of those in cooperation with the actual teams. You can access Roku Sports on the Roku Channel app, which is available on Roku. Samsung, smart TVs, Fire TV devices, iOS, and Android, but not on Apple TV or Google TV. Instagram chief Adam Masseri wrote in a post Wednesday that views will be the primary metric across formats in the coming weeks. So if you're a creator, you'll now be tracking an overall engagement number across reels, stories, photos, and everything else you do on Instagram. Masseri explains that a view is different than overall reach because a recipient can view the same piece of content multiple times endlessly. And that technically counts for more than just the once. Masari also urges creators to pay attention to the number of sends that they get per reach, meaning how many times somebody sees your content and then passes that along to their own audience. Earlier this year, Instagram also added total view count to Threads posts as well. How much would you pay for AMD's new 9000 series Ryzen 9 processors? Don't answer because I'm about to tell you how much you'll pay. They announced the prices. Uh, so the Ryzen 9 9950X, that's the 16 core one, will launch on August 15th and it will cost you $649. Yes, that's $50 less than the two-year-old Ryzen 9 7950X. And in fact, the entire lineup is around $20 to $50 less than the equivalent 7000 series chips. For example, the 9700X 9, is $359. The 9600X is $279. Both those launch on August 8th. And the other one launching on August 15th, uh, the 9900X is $499. AMD will launch new motherboard chipsets for the 9000 series at some point, but until that happens, your existing AM5 motherboards will be supported until at least 2027, if not longer. Anchor announced a new hand, handful of new accessories to its Prime series designed to quickly charge multiple devices at once. The 250-watt GAN Prime charging station goes for $170 with voltage monitoring and an updated display. The more compact 200-watt GAN charging station goes for $80. It has four USB-C ports and two USB-A ports, so good for travel. Anchor's new Prime 100-watt GAN wall charger will run you $85, and it's also offering a six-foot USB-C charge cable for 35. Reddit plans to start experimenting with search result summaries generated by large language models, LLMs, later this year. Reddit has current partnerships with both OpenAI and Google, but says it's going to use other technology to do this as well. For those of you wondering how Reddit 
plans to increase revenue and has been doing so by limited API access going forward. It's doing pretty well. The company's Q2 revenue was up 54% year over year. That's a big jump. Daily active unique users were up 51% year over year. The company, which still isn't profitable, did see losses lessen. The losses fell uh, from 41.1 million last year to 10.1 million this year, uh, this quarter. So going in the right direction. Good news for just one half of Reddit's first year as a public company. Huffman also hinted at something that many of you might not like to hear, and that is paywalled subreddits. This is a possible source of revenue that he says would not replace the current Reddit model. The current Reddit mo model, as it stands, is still free and kind of the Wild West, but they could offer new use cases for a subreddit that might share exclusive content or private areas for some sort of fee. Now, Redditors tend to hate change, <laughs> and they're often very vocal about that. Paying for content on a subreddit is going to turn some people off for sure, but Reddit wants to make money. It had a good quarter, and it wants to continue to do that. It has to do some experimenting. Scott, would you pay to be part of a subreddit if you felt like the quality was there? I mean, kind of. I, I feel like it need, would really need to prove that, and the hard part about proving that is you have to get me to try it. And to get me to try it, I have to kind of have some faith that it's going to work. And maybe there's a trial or whatever. But I don't know if that's going to be enough. Um, I think that they should make sure that however this works, there is plenty to preview or experience before people lock in. If it's highly curated, and it's exactly what you're looking for, and let's say very specialized in an area I'm really into, um, then maybe. Um, I, I don't think that's all that different than supporting Patreons for various kinds of work that various Patreons do. It's not all podcasts. Some people do 3D art. And if it's a good Patreon, I want to support it. And I get access to things I wouldn't have otherwise. Um, so there's an opportunity there. How much Reddit gets of that and how much they you know, make sure that mods and curators get is a big question. But overall, yeah, the answer is yes, if the content's there. They just really would need to give me a good preview before I would lock in. I like your Patreon comparison because I think what would be smart, this isn't necessarily what Reddit will do, but what would be smart is to say, Redditors, you can make part of your re subreddit paywalled off if you want, uh, and you can make all of it paywalled off if you want. You are the community runners. We are giving you a tool for that, and here's the revenue split, right? Uh, and there'll be a lot of, you know, complaining about what the revenue split should be and what it is and all of that. But if you're going to have paywalls on Reddit, that's the only way I can see it working is to say this is a community-led website. So the community will decide what goes beyond the paywall and what doesn't. Yeah, and that community will determine the, the longevity of your room. And if it's not great, then you unsub to it and those numbers will speak for themselves. I mean, I, I understand why a lot of people are balking at this because this is this represents a a big sea change for them. You know, Reddit a big open free place that became kind of its own internet in some ways. And it's still the place I get the most search results when I'm looking for very specific things. Um, that and YouTube. And uh, to say that we're gonna put this behind some kind of wall is gonna make some people very uncomfortable and not happy about it. Um, yeah. You know. it, it, the, the, there is no shortage of people distrusting what Reddit is about to do, and there never has been. Uh, there is some bad blood out there because of the way a lot of developers feel after the API shut down, uh, and a lot of community people feel bad about it. Obviously, there was we talked for a long time about all of the, the Redditor moderator uh, revolt and all of that, but where is that now? I mean, I think that Reddit probably had to do what it did. Maybe it could have done it better, but in the end, you've got, what did you say, Sarah? Daily unique users up 51%. Like yep. it didn't didn't drive people away uh, and it is increasing their revenue. They're on the road to profitability. So I, I don't think people are going to turn against Reddit as much as everyone often says they are. And if this is done right, and if they do it like I'm talking about, where you you are in control of your own subreddit, whether it goes behind the paywall or not, and and then it'll all be about what's the split. Reddit will collect the money and give you a portion of it. Do they give you 90% of it? Great. I think people would be thrilled with that. They give you 70%. Well, okay, now we're feeling like Apple. They give you 50%, then it's going to be Twitch anger.
Yeah, I think the big the yeah. big hang up for me would be as a as a regular Reddit user, how much of my existing Reddits that I've relied on for a decade or more. Uh, that I think are really well curated now, how many of those will say, oh, we're going to close this door and uh, you'll have to pay to get in here. Right. Like we're already so popular. Even yeah. if we lose some folks, you know, we might, we might end up. And I mean, who's to blame them? I don't blame them. I'd do it too. You know, yeah. I, I think the only way that this, this, you know, sort of some of these proposed ideas get weird, at least for my, you know, in my experience would be if these AI generated search results promote a lot of paywalled subreddits and it feels pushed upon us, you know, above other subreddits that are not behind a paywall that also might be perfectly fine for the community that I would, you know, jive with. That yeah. would that would feel artificial and and um you know, d just a little nefarious. But that's not what they're doing. Not not yet anyway. So, I think yeah, just, a lot it's of kind ifs. of a w wait and see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I feel like if you let the subredditors decide whether they want to paywall or not, those subreddits will work it out with their communities because they are close to their community and they know, oh, our community will turn against us if we tried to put a paywall or our community will tolerate a certain type of content because we've talked to them about it and they would be willing to pay for this much. Other communities may try to put in a paywall and it doesn't work and go back to not having a paywall. But this is how you find out. You experiment, you try it out. What you shouldn't experiment with is whether you have a bug in your code or not by just pushing it on 8.5 million Windows machines. <laughs> uh, but uh, we have the full explanation from CrowdStrike. We're not going to belabor it, but I figure a lot of you are interested in the quick summary of like, you know what, I, I, I don't want to read the whole report. Please just tell me what I need to know. Uh, really, I would direct you to Jessica Lyons at the register. She wrote an excellent summary. Uh, if you want a more detailed explanation without having to go through the entire explanation from CrowdStrike. But here's the short version. The Falcon sensor looks for patterns of behavior so it can alert the user if that pattern matches something suspicious. Uh, we talked about this before on DTNS, but to refresh your memory, CrowdStrike pushes template types for specific types of threats and then updates those templates as it gets new information on the patterns with template instances. So the template type is a little more of the, here's what to look for with content pipes in this case. The template instance is like, oh, uh, here's some parameters that you wanna match, right? An instant was pushed on July 19th, which instructed the sensor to use the 21st parameter field in the template type. Template type had 21 parameters. The problem was the instances only ever had 20. Now, normally that wasn't a problem because they only asked for the sensor to use 20 parameters and gave them 20 parameters. But on July 19th, they asked for it to use that 21st parameter, but the instance only had 20 parameters. Here's what the CrowdStrike report said. The attempt to access the 21st value produced an out-of-bounds memory read beyond the end of the input data array and resulted in a system crash. So if I may anthropomorphize that for you, the template instance said, please set aside 20 slots in your array for these parameters. You did that? Great. Now read me the 21st. And the sensor said, that doesn't make any sense. I quit and crashed. And because it was in the Windows kernel, uh, then the kernel crashed. Uh, so it, it reminds me of that joke, there are two men in a boat, the third man turns to the second man, says, what am I doing here, uh, is essentially the bug <laughs> That was in CrowdStrike. Uh, you may want to know what CrowdStrike is going to do about that. Uh, CrowdStrike has updated its sensor content compiler to make sure the right number of inputs are used in the future. Check to make sure all that matches. Uh, the Falcon sensors content interpreter will do runtime bound checking and array size checking to be like, wait, we're not asking for some memory that's out of bounds, right? OK, the array matches what the parameters are. Great. Now we can let it run. Uh, if it doesn't match, then it won't run and it won't crash. Uh, they're also, as we mentioned before, go doing more internal testing and staged rollouts, which will delay how fast these updates come, but it will catch in unanticipated bugs like this. Mm. I mean, it feels just like perfect storm bug, right? Like the kind of bug that uh, nobody saw coming 
And then when it happened, all the all the circumstances had to be just right to have it do well, what yeah, it did. Well, yeah, because the bug was there for two instances, and it just never used that 21st parameter by chance. Mm -hmm. And so it didn't crash until that third one when it did. Yeah, it almost feels like a power overload. It's not. It's not even. It's not comparable in any technical way. But this idea that you were always just up on the edge and you just didn't know it. But if you went over that edge and hit that final slot, you were gonna. You know, the house was gonna burn down. <laughs> and I, I know it, it probably sounds like, well, sh shouldn't it be easy to catch? Like, oh, wait, this thing has twenty one slots, but it's at, you know, there's only it only has twenty slots, and it's asking for a twenty first. Um, yeah, but anybody who's coded knows that kind of stuff can happen. Uh, you, you, you just, it's the kind of bug that, you, that drives you crazy when it happens, but it happens a lot. And usually it's caught. It's not always caught. And when it's not caught, it can cause a problem. A lot of times the problem happens before it gets pushed out to the world. Uh, this, like you said, was kind of a perfect storm of, it was the kind of thing that got past the validator because the validator wasn't matching them. Uh, there was a wild card apparently involved and it kept it from telling that there was a problem. Uh, it got past the first couple of rounds and so everybody thought everything was fine. Yeah, just, just uh, it is the kind of bug that happens and sadly it happened in the worst way possible. Yeah, I mean, just just listening to this ex explanation um, and sort of expectation on CrowdStrike's uh, um, side that it, everything was supposed to work perfectly. It had been using this method previously, you know? So that's sort of like, okay, there was there was the discrepancy, but there was no red flag until there was, you know, a massive Until there meltdown. was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like there was no sort of like they knew, they knew, they were warned. That would be different. And that's why some of the companies that ended up being affected by this outage, of which there were many, some more than others, um, you know, I kind of feel like, yeah, you lost money. Uh, business to, uh, businesses took hits. IT departments <laughs> working around the clock trying to figure this out. I mean, bad all around. I don't think... I don't think there's much CrowdStrike could have done differently. You might be listening to this and saying, no, no, somebody should be fired. Maybe somebody has been fired, um, you know, or, or multiple people. But uh, yeah, I think, I, I don't know. I don't know that CrowdStrike needs to be, um, besides figuring out what happened, um, obviously being very, very public about its um, investigation into what happened, what needs to change, how it has been changed. Um, I don't know what else CrowdStrike can do. That's kind I of it, right? They just have to. I, yeah, I mean, this kind the of, uh, only other thing that they might sure. they might have to do is pay some companies for lost lost right. uh, revenue, you know, for damages, monetary right. damages. And I don't know. I don't know. I think those arguments are a little thin. Yeah. The uh, the the I don't see other than never make a mistake. <laughs> what else CrowdStrike <laughs> could have done? Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I know CrowdStrike is looking at this going, gosh, I wish we hadn't made this mistake. Uh, staged rollouts are a great way to to provide a safety net for this. Uh, as Clinton Woodward says, uh, bound checking is hard. Uh, and so I think a lot more people are understanding that that was the error. Uh, but if you had the staged rollout, you had a safety net. I also understand why a security company who thinks, you know what, we, we, we don't really have a lot of areas where there could be a, a really bad bug. Uh, let's push these things out fast because faster people get security stuff, the faster they're protected, uh, would understandably think that, uh, they were wrong <laughs> and, uh, they, I got to guess they won't be wrong again. No, this not feels in that like, way. Anyway. Yeah. This feels like something that changes your fundamental, uh, processes i don't know i mean maybe hopefully for the better but yeah this is a big one so you don't want to repeat it uh well folks uh what we do want you to repeat is buying stuff from our store uh if you've ever done it before uh we'd like you to repeat it now if you've already done it this week i'm not saying like buy more uh but if you hadn't heard we have like a thousand mouse pads uh and uh they don't take up a lot of space but you know what they've been sitting around for a while so we're trying to clear them out those are cheap 
Uh, you could build a little fort out of them. You could you could tile your walls with them. We're selling them for two bucks each. So, you know, you could even use your mouse on it. Go check it out at the Daily Tech News Show store. And if you'd always wanted a DTNS mug for a temporary amount of time, they are down to $5 because those are heavy. Uh, so we're clearing some of those out as well. These prices are temporary. They will not last forever. Uh, so if you are interested, go check it out. DailyTechNewsShow.com slash store. The Borderlands movie, which is based on the popular loot shooter video game from Gearbox, is starring Kate Blanchett and opening in the U.S. this Friday. In an interview with Polygon, Randy Pitchford, Gearbox's CEO, says the movie adaptation process began with a point-and-click adventure version of the game co-developed with Telltale Games called Tales from the Borderland. The success of that game gave him and the company confidence to move forward with a real Borderlands film. Now, whether the movie itself is going to be good remains to be seen, but Slash Film notes that estimates for opening weekend box office intake is only around 13 to $18 million against an estimated $120 million budget. Now, Scott, there have been some very expensive movies that haven't done so well at the box office for a variety of reasons over the last couple of years. So what's your take on Borderlands? Well, okay, so this one's interesting because we are coming off of what seems like a bunch of indicators for the film industry and the gaming industry that game adaptations to film are having a moment, uh, television as well. And they're not wrong. We've seen really recent heavy successes like The Last of Us, the Mario movie, uh, the Sonic movies have done really well. And most recently, this Fallout show on Prime was a massive hit and has gotten Emmy nominations. Like, it's kind of a big deal. And they're all as based on video games as they can be. So I think there's a feeling overall in Hollywood and in the games business where people are like, yeah, it's time. It's time for this stuff to shine. We do a lot of really cool narrative stuff. We have a lot of original worlds and stories to tell. Why not do it on the big or small screen uh, and really blow this thing out? So all of that being said, now you have Borderlands, a beloved game. People really like it. Not really known for its story. I would say Tales from the Borderlands, which was kind of a spin out, obviously had a bunch more story. It was based on a story. Um, and they and they did well with that story. It was good. But the, the core game, not so much. And that's mostly what players played. So their expectations are probably kind of all over the place. If you said, hey, James Gunn's heading this thing up, I would probably go, oh, well, that A explains why it looks a little like Guardians uh, and B. Uh, we like him. We trust him. He makes good movies. He's yet to fail us. So let's see how this goes. But instead, we have Eli Roth, and he's a guy who is famous for horror movies, uh, some pretty gnarly ones. He he directed the original Hostel and Cabin of the Woods and a few other things. Um, he's also starred in a few movies as well. But for the most part, that's his directorial, you know, space. And so he comes along and says, "All right, I'm going to do a PG-13 rated thing based on a video game that he apparently really likes. So you know, he's got something invested in it personally." And a really great cast, people like, you know, Kate Blanchett, you don't just get them out of nowhere. Um, and that's all good. Yeah. The, the, this is just, one, it, this is feeling like one of those we're not quite sure. This happened with Halo on uh, Paramount, where they just didn't quite nail it. They weren't, uh, they didn't go all in on what makes the game great. I think they were afraid to. And the reason I think Fallout succeeded wildly in the new Mario game or movie, for example, did because those leaned heavily into what makes those games work. Um, I think that's the lesson. So if they do that and they get this combination of wacky sci-fi and wasteland action that is the Borderlands series, if they can get those two things sewn together, they might pull it off and we'll all think differently of how you know Eli Roth makes mainstream movies. Um, but we're going to have to wait until we see some critic reviews and, of course, see what audiences think when it comes out this weekend. Um, I would remind people that we're, we're just at the top of what looks like a long line of this. Uh, just next year alone, or even this year, Sonic the Hedgehog 3 comes out in November or December. Minecraft, the movie, another weird one, comes out next April. Uh, Five Nights at Freddy's 2, off the success of the first one, comes out fall of 2025. And there's a new sequel to the new Super Mario Brothers movie 2 coming out April 3rd of 2026. These are just the ones with confirmed dates. I have a list of, I don't know, 60 other properties that have been optioned for film and are in various stages of development and writing and you know scripting and that sort of thing so we are going to see more of these the question is will we be able to match the success and the quality of the ones i mentioned uh and not end up with another you know assassin's creed which was terrible or uh 
Prince of Persia, which was really bad. Like there's some bad ones. The Doom movie, really bad. Uh, I think there's a chance here to keep this going, but I just hope the lessons have been learned. The players are now old enough to make movies about this stuff and they're writing the scripts. So I'm optimistic. For Borderlands, eh, I'm a little on the 50-50 scale right now. We'll have to see. I wonder if we have moved into the stage, or at least we're moving into the stage, where uh, you can make movies based on video games that are good or also bad. Mm. It depends on the movie maker and the team, not the fact that it's a video game, right? Like, right. Uh, if imagine if we were having this conversation about books, and we're like, oh, man, that Dr. Sleep movie was a bit of a disappointment. I, I don't know if you can really make movies based on books because, <laughs> you know, they didn't do well with that. Uh, it's, it's going to vary based on the source material. Some video games lend themselves into being made into movies better than others and the team that's adapting it uh, and whether they're yeah. good at it. Yeah. I don't think they even have to be, like, great movies. They really don't. They just have to be unafraid to lean into what made the games popular in the first place and not try to please everybody what they think audiences want on the movie side. Yeah. It's an expensive proposition, well, but I really do think... Not, you, yeah. Even if you're not super true to the source material, um, that can work as long as it's a really good movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you have know? to have... The, the, the talent is being able to tell what made it a good video game, what makes a good movie, and what's the Venn diagram that crosses those. Right, yeah. yeah. And that's trickier than it sounds because it's expensive, and that's why these risks are hard to take. So I don't know. I'm, I am hopeful for it, overall optimistic over the long run. It is definitely better than anything we had prior to this. It's kind of following the way we went with superhero movies, by the way, for the longest time, mm -hmm. decades. Nothing but garbage, all right? Suddenly, 08, <laughs> roughly, we start getting amazing stuff. Batman starts a little earlier than that. And before you know it, most of them are good. I think that's where we're headed. I can't wait for the Candy Crush movie. All right. <laughs> Let's check they out the They made an Angry Birds movie, so. <laughs> they sure did. Yeah. More than one. Yeah. <laughs> In the mailbag, Frankie T wrote in, there's lots of news about smart rings, but I want a ring that does multi-factor authentication. Token ring made headlines a few years ago, but all I see doing research is information for businesses and enterprises. Do y'all have recommendations for a ring that works as a security key? Then I can't lose it or forget it. If, if I lose my hand, I have much larger problems. Very yes, true, you, you do. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I wouldn't call this a recommendation because I don't know anything about the product. But Cybernetic offers the encryptor ring. It is a $300 ring. So probably not what you are expecting to pay. Uh, but it is FIDO2 compliant. So it can work as a, uh, like a YubiKey. Uh, it can work as a Tesla key card. Uh, it's made of zirconia ceramic uh and has, has you know a lot of other uh things to it it's nfc etc three-year warranty for your 300 hundred hundred dollar ring um but there it is if you were like oh i want to be able to buy one at any price well there you go and your price is 300 dollars. yeah spend wisely yeah get cybernetic.com yeah. uh, I mean, hey, if it junior, works well that's better than than you know who knows for, yeah getting yeah. where it is all the time well, yeah. i agree uh anon junior wrote us on patreon sad to see chromecast getting shelved if i wanted a box like apple or amazon i'd have one of their boxes chromecast works great for our current setup i split the apartment with my sister and her husband and none of us want our account to be the one the streaming box is logged into chromecast fixed that by keeping all the account stuff on the phone slash tablet of the individual. I don't have my recommendations skewed by what they watch and vice versa. I'll have to double check which model we have and probably grab the last one while I can. Oh, man. Uh, yeah, yeah, if you didn't hear uh, the uh, the Chromecast, as soon as the current inventory is sold out, riding we'll off be, into the sunset, we'll be mm -hmm. casting its last. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But you can cast to the new Google TV streamer. Right. If all yes. you care about is casting, you may not want to pay that much, but you can still cast to it, and you can still get Fire TV Stick, Roku Stick, and stuff like that. Yeah, I'm seeing it's weird. We saw this move to dongles, and now we're seeing a move away from not away from dongles, but they're well, Google's up their moving away stuff. from dongles. Yeah. yeah, and they were the prime mover into dongles. They yeah. made dongles yeah. happen. 
Yeah, they made dongles it's, a thing. So Google's weird. like, it's, it's crowded. Nope, we're out of here. We're going to do something different. It's weird to see Google I, kill something that's popular. Yeah, uh, right? Weird. I don't, just, I've never seen them do that. It's very unlike Google. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Strange. Yeah. So out of character. Yeah. Um, Scott Johnson, we're glad that you're always the same character, which is an awesome character. You're like a really good video game that got turned into a movie. Exactly. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. So well, when you're not doing all of that, what are you doing? <laughs> well, I, I do have some exciting news, and some of your listeners will, will know about this, and some won't. But if you're a World of Warcraft fan, you may know that I did a 16-year run on a podcast called The Instance. It was uh, pretty popular, and uh, we did a really rig strong run with it. And then there was a break, and there's lots of reasons why there was a break. It was about two years ago. Well, guess what? It's coming back. Yeah, that's right. Uh, we're supposed to record next week uh, with my brand new host, Bobby Frankenberger, who brings a lot of hardcore play to the table, uh, as well as just a brand new expansion coming and all kinds of exciting stuff. The return of Chris Metzen to Blizzard. These kinds of things are very exciting, and I'm playing again like a wild man. So if you are interested in World of Warcraft, you can now go to frogpants.com slash instance, grab the new feed. The old one may or may not work for you. Uh, I recommend getting the fresh one. There's some confusion on the RSS. Uh, but go check it out and listen to us. Uh, for our brand new monthly series, The Instance, at frogpants.com slash instance. I'm very, very excited about this, but I have one question, Scott. Go. Will there be a town crier? There will be. That's funny yes. you should ask. And not only that, there will be a combination of old crier doing his thing and new yeah. crier, a oh. five-year-old, who I am also related to. There's a new town crier in town. There's a new crier me. in town, Tom. <laughs> That's right. Fantastic. Uh, patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. You may have heard that X is suing advertisers for not advertising on X. We'll talk about if that's a good idea. You can catch our show Monday through Friday. We do it live at 4 p.m. Eastern. That is 2000 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back tomorrow talking with Dr. Nikki Ackermans and a deep dive into an AI model that predicts the structure and interactions of all of life's molecules. You know, just simple stuff. We'll talk to you then. <laughs> the DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>